totally and completely supportive of Francesco and his team. This guy is not here to mess about. And I believe that he is the man that will take this club to a level that perhaps is beyond my imagination. The air and the feeling at that time was massive excitement. The mood was it was very excited. We felt like we were going to be, you know, in good hands. Well, everything changed, and everything changed very quickly. Bicchetti pretty much wanted to decide who the team was and who was who was signed. You could just tell from the body language of the players how strange it was. It was bizarre. It didn't. It just didn't feel right. This is a very different culture, and a culture that doesn't belong at Brisbane Road. Welcome to the very first episode of The Circus Upstairs. I'm James Masters, journalist and long-suffering Leighton Orient fan. And I'm Matt Simpson, author of the book Leighton Orient Greats, once reduced to a price of 12 pence in the Walthamstow branch of Tesco. 12 pence. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, Matt. Cause... Well, what I would say is it's 12 chapters, so it's one pence per chapter. Just tremendous, Matt. That's just tremendous. <laughs> Is a crazy economic ploy by Tesco to reduce the price that much. It's just an incredible, it's just an incredible statistic, really. Anyway, moving on. First question, James. Why exactly are we doing this podcast? Well, look, you know, we were very bored in lockdown. <laughs> um, I think I think it was a, it was a couple of years ago, isn't it, Matt, when you you first emailed me or messaged me and um, said, look. You know, it's been a few years now. Do you think it's time that everyone knew the real story about what happened under the reign of Francesco Bacchetti? And, I, you know, outside of an Orient fan, I think, if you look at modern day football, it is one of the most tumultuous periods in, in a football club that we've witnessed. And so many football clubs are going through challenging periods and we've seen clubs going out of business. And, you know, it, it, it nearly happened to us. You know, let's, let's not kid ourselves, or we nearly cease to exist, which would have been a tragedy for so many people. And I think when you said, you know, we need to tell this story, um, I, I was in straight away. I don't know, I, what inspired you? What, what was it about the story that made you think we needed to tell it? Uh, the only other thing I was doing in lockdown was drinking very heavily. Well, I mean, <laughs> I wasn't doing that. I was being forced to watch Moana every single day <laughs> for weeks upon end. Um, so this seemed like a good idea. Okay, so we're hoping that we have listeners that aren't just Orient fans. Um, So we should probably explain a couple of things up front. So I've got a bit of a challenge for you, James. Could you deliver the entire history of Leighton Orient in 60 seconds? No, but what I would say is that if there was the opportunity to take despair from the jaws of victory, then this is the club for you. So to bring us up to when Francesco Bocchetti took over the club, uh, the season before that, uh, under the ownership of Barry Hearn, who'd famously bought the club for a fiver in, I'm going to say, 1995, his, uh, what turned out to be last season owning the club, was a very successful season. What happened, or oh, almost successful season, I should say. What happened in 2013-14? Trying to wipe off my memory, Matt. They had already had a fantastic season and uh, reached the, the League One playoff final. Yeah, they did. This was under manager Russell Slade, former PE teacher, never played the game himself. He was a Ron Seal sort of manager. He does what it says on the tin. And his tin said, pick the same team every week, always play 4-4-2. But as O's fans, we were happy with that. We're simple people. So as you say, in 2013-14, it all came together under Russell. We finished third. We reached the playoff final. It was against Rotherham who I wouldn't say are a bogey team for us, but their manager, Steve Evans, is definitely a bogey up the nose of football. Fair? A bit harsh. A bit harsh on the bogey, but yeah. <laughs> we were 2-0 we were up at half-time, ended the game at 2-2, it went to penalties, and inevitably, this is what happened. Dagnall to keep this game alive, saved by Adam Collin! Rotherham have won it with two penalty saves from Adam Collin. And obviously what transpired, you know, it's led to me being in therapy for at least a couple <laughs> of years. But what, what I would say, 
what followed that and what happened under the Chetty just exacerbated everything, which made it even more painful to be so close to the championship and then to go into non-league football and the way it was allowed to happen. I think one of the important things about the squad that season, which relates to what happens afterwards, is I think every single player was brought in on a free transfer or had come through the youth ranks. There was uh, probably one sort of big name in Kevin Nisby, but he was definitely at the end of his career. But pretty much apart from that, everyone else in the squad were good, solid, lower league players who gelled well together, who had a good spirit, who um, were obviously motivated and organised well by the manager, Russell Slade. There was no money spent on the players. The players, you know, they really look like such a tight-knit unit, but also they overachieved. I think they overachieved. Okay, so um, shortly after the playoff final, on the 7th of July, it was announced that Italian waste management billionaire Francesco Bacchetti was buying Leighton Orient. What do we know about waste management billionaire Francesco Bacchetti? Well, we didn't, initially we didn't know much, did we, Matt? We, um, I don't think anyone really heard of him. Do you not follow the uh, Italian waste management sector closely? I mean, I promise you to know that, but I do have slightly better things to do. <laughs> uh, head of a renewable energy and waste management firm, the Bacchetti Energy Group. Um, and according to the mail at the time, mm-hmm. um, he'd already been linked with takeovers at Reading and Bari. Did he have any experience of running a football club? Uh, no, I, I didn't see any experience in football whatsoever. And that kind of, that worried me a bit. But what, what happened Did was, he have a volleyball team? I think he did have a volleyball team. Yeah. But that volleyball, is, I'd say, is quite different to, to football. You can use your hands. Touche. <laughs> uh, Someone who met Bacchetti early on through the, negotiation, uh, through the negotiations about buying the club was Matt Porter. Who's Matt Porter, James? Well, Matt Porter, Barry's right-hand man, I guess. Been, he's already through and through fan. He's been the, the media guy, been the chief executive. Famously yeah. became the chief executive at... 13 or 14 years old? <laughs> he's, uh, he's someone who has Orient at heart, you know, um, and I think someone that everyone at Orient respects. So let's listen to what Matt had to say about the first time he met Mr. Bacchetti. The first time we met would have been in the boardroom at Orient. Um, I remember him bringing a lot of people with him, probably around 10, really, advisors, lawyers, all, all sort of Italian um, and the meeting was quite cordial. He was, you know, quite friendly and everything like that. He got irate at one point, shouted a few things in Italian, stomped off for a bit, calmed down, came back, even was friendly again. Yeah, I don't know whether that was showing off or posturing or, you know, his, his natural style, whatever, but it was just kind of a bit silly. You're a Leighton Orient fan. Did you feel like the club would be in safe hands? Look, he, you know... As, as I've said before, he obviously didn't walk into the room with a big sign on his head that said, I'm a complete lunatic. You know, he, 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 he was friendly. He was positive. He talked about family, he talked about community, he talked about stability. He seemed to be very fond of Russell, or not fond of, but he seemed to be, you know, enthusiastic about Russell and the players. And he, all he talked about was that a little bit more investment would be enough to get us into the championship. So he, he made all the right noises. Given what subsequently happened, do, do you now look back and see any warning signs? Perhaps the perhaps a lack of background knowledge about him. But yeah, look, there's always an element of risk with owners who aren't born and bred with the club. By default, a lot of people who are not from the local community of the club that they buy don't have the same affiliation with it as as other people. So it's perhaps easier for them to make wrong decisions because they're not as emotionally embedded in it. I like that. He didn't walk in with a sign saying I'm a lunatic on his head. It's a shame he didn't because we could have avoided all of this. Right. A few days later, Mr. Bacchetti and Barry Hearn conducted a joint press conference and we're going to listen in to a little bit of that. Today we're here to announce and to confirm the acquisition of Matchroom Sports 90% shareholding in Lake Norham Football Club has been acquired by Mr. Pacetti and his family interests. It was palpable excitement. You know, people were excited by this. They thought that this guy was a real deal. They thought that he was going to bring success, that he had money, that he knew what he was doing. And I think Barry has come out and said, you know, he would never have sold 
or in, if you'd known what was going to transpire. But even, you know, I don't think anyone could see what was going to transpire, such was the dramatic unravelling of the club. Let's listen to what Barry said about Paquetti in the conference. I listen to this uh, friend on my right, and I look in his eyes, and I see a little bit of Barry Hearn 20 years ago. He has excitement, he has vision, he has enthusiasm, but most of all, as all Italians have, he has a wealth of passion. This guy is not here to mess about. Over the years, I've always been consistent in saying the moment I find someone, in my view, that can take this club further than I can, I'm out. And I believe that he is the man that will take this club to a level that perhaps is beyond my imagination. And I, as an Orient fan, I'm excited to be watching this happen. So, I mean, to be fair, he did take Orient to a level no one could imagine. He took us into the National League. Like, it's difficult to listen to without laughing because... All the statements were accurate. They were accurate, just not in he the way. Ha- he did take us further than we've ever been before, just further down than we've ever been before. And then in that press conference, we heard from Bacchetti himself through a translator. The passion for a challenge belongs to our very DNA. We have won challenges in a business arena and in various industries around the world. We think that together with Barry and our friends we found here, that our stuff will be uh, wonderfully integrated with his and we can look to new horizons, new future, new ambitions for Leighton Orient, for its uh, supporters and history. That didn't happen. I mean, I don't think that makes sense. No, that really makes sense. <laughs> the other thing I remember is that um, Bacchetti, through his translator, said that they were already working hard into the night and that he'd asked Russell Slade to put together a list of his top targets for every position yeah. and that he'd been authorised to go for the targets right at the top of the list. Do you remember that? I think it was something like Russell said that you could be shopping at Harrods now rather than maybe Primark before. Maybe you could take us through some of the signings that followed in the sort of days and weeks after that press conference. We're thinking about the players that are coming, the names that are being mentioned. And, you know, these were good players. These were you know, players with championship experience. I'm looking at there are Sanderson, Joby McAnuff, and of course Jay Simpson, who who went on to score goals for fun. Um, so these these are players who would be on good wages, good pedigree, and you look at it on paper at least, and you think, well, it's an upgrade. You know, I, I think this, these were players who would would walk into to most League One teams. Um, so let's go back to Matt Porter and get his view on the signing players. Bacchetti's big thing was to invest in the team and clearly he did that with with a number of high profile signings that came in who were who were on decent money um but his aspirations at times were unrealistic and he put a lot of pressure on Russell Slade to sign expensive players i mean there was one guy who we looked at who was earning 39,000 pounds a week now he couldn't understand why this player didn't want to sign for Leighton Orient so you know, it, it, it became quite difficult for Russell to, to manage that because, to be frank, Russ was quite happy with the squad that had lost in the playoff final with a couple of sensible additions. I think we signed Adam Legstins to play in goal, Shane Lowry at centre-half. But it was all about, why can't we sign this player? Why can't we sign that player? And, and I mean, later on down the line, they tried to sign a player who was a, Repub- a, a, a current Republic of Ireland international at that time. And... You know, the guy went to another Premier League club and it was sort of almost a bit embarrassing to sort of, to whoever it was who had to phone up and say, oh, it's Lake Norient here, we're interested in signing so-and-so. You know, I mean, just not, not, not a, a likely option. So anyway, there, there was a lot of pressure on Russ to, to sign these players and, you know, strengthen the squad as it was perceived to be in that way. And it became quite difficult that, you know, that essentially it was obvious that, Bicchetti pretty much wanted to decide who the team was and, you know, who, who was who was signed. I love that. I mean, why don't you just sign Cristiano Ronaldo? Why don't you sign Messi? What's wrong with you? I would love to have been a fly in that room when Bicchetti was told Slade that they should look at a player in the Premier League earning 39000 a week. And I wonder what Russell would have said.
someone who knows the club perhaps as well as anyone is Dave Victor, who's covered Orient for the BBC for, I'm going to say decades. I'm sorry, Dave, that makes you sound really old. More than one decade, let's say. And we spoke to Dave and got his take on the new signings. The money was certainly there and the players came in. But uh, a lot of players came in very quickly. And we know that uh, when Leighton Orient had achieved so much the season before with so little that the squad needed a little bit more. Um, but you didn't get the sense that the players that came in were the sort that Russell Slade would have wanted because he was somebody that always talked about they're a good group, Dave. That's what he used to say to me sort of post-match. They're, they're a great bunch of characters. So I think what, what we're seeing is that Perhaps the seeds of discontent were being sowed early on before the season started in that we that Russell Slade had a very solid group of players who had mostly held together. Some big money signings came in, which uh, I guess on paper looked like progress, but potentially caused some ruptures in the mood of the squad. Yeah, and also, you know, I think that playoff season, those players have been earning you know, similar money, similar money. But when you introduce players into that squad who are obviously earning a lot more, I think it's only natural that there is some resentment. And when things don't go well, that resentment builds, and then that's where you have problems. For sure. Um, but I, I think, as we said earlier, the general mood was one of real positivity through the club, through the fans. Um, and we spoke to Nathan Clark, who was the captain of the Orient team that did reach the... Um, playoff final the season before he stayed on that season and got his take on how he was feeling before the season started the mood was uh, it was very excited um you know we were the chairman had uh, had handed it over to um to these guys coming in with with big ideas you know we we had you know real top players walking through the door and there was certainly a, a good buzz around going back in for pre-season um, and the excitement was certainly there. Obviously, the disappointment of of the final had sort of gone. We were we were looking to uh, to really push on. We felt like we were going to be, you know, in good hands. And we also spoke to Tom Jeffs, who was the commercial manager at Leighton Orient, both before Bacchetti arrived and during that first season, uh, who had some really interesting behind the scenes take on it. But he felt equal sort of positivity um, before the start of the season. If I'm completely honest, that the air and the feeling at that time was massive excitement. Everything was, you know, multi multi millionaire or billionaire. Well, you know, whatever they would describe as owners coming in from Italy, and they were gonna take the club to the next level, and you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was all very very positive. However. After that initial optimism, in the first few days even, it became apparent to some of those on the inside that things were starting to look a bit amiss. Here's what Dave Victor had to say about that. Well, everything changed, and everything changed very quickly. Um, it changed pre-season, and a friendly away at Gateshead. And that's when I really got a sense that things uh, had really gone uh, very badly wrong. Um, because... It, you could just tell from the body language of the players how strange it was. The situation was an unusual one for me personally. Johnny Davis was the uh, media manager at the time, and he asked if I would help David, David Mooney. Now, uh, he's a striker, and his wife was pregnant. She was expecting a baby any moment, and he wanted desperately to get home as quickly as possible. Johnny knew that I was going to jump in the car, and he asked if I would give uh, David a lift home. Now, I think... I knew Russell Slade and I knew the squad well enough to know that um, not so long ago that wouldn't have been a problem. But I was waiting and normally sort of Russell Slade would say, yeah, go on, Dave, that, that, thanks for your help. And it wasn't a big deal, but everybody was waiting and it was evident that it wasn't Russell's decision. But you got the sense that somebody else had to say it was OK for David Mooney not to go back with the squad. And we also went back to commercial manager Tom Jeffs to get his take on how things were starting to unravel a little bit. It was bizarre. It was just, it didn't, it just didn't feel right. No one, no one was really asking too many questions, but I, d I don't really know what I expected, but in, in my mind, I expected, 
you know, maybe us to meet the new owners and sit down with them and discuss our plans going forward and what we were going to do. And, and there was just nothing. And it went on like day after day, week, month after month, and there was just nothing. And, and then finally, we uh, went back to Matt Porter and asked him how things were going in those early days. There was an incident just before the start of the season. So players have have individual bonuses in their contract, in their contracts, but they also have a collective bonus sheet which will reward them for cup runs, promotion, reaching the playoffs, things like that. And the way that that works is that the whole squad's on the same deal. Everybody signs up to it. And if the club wants to alter it and uh, make the terms worse, then if they don't agree to that, it defaults back to the previous document. It's quite a strong position for the players to be in. I assume it was negotiated by the PFA years ago. I don't, I don't know. Um, but Bichetti wanted to change the win bonus scheme and I think from memory, there were some pretty hefty rewards in there for things like promotion, but some of the more um, day-to-day bonuses, if you like, were, were weakened. And it, wasn't as, it wouldn't have been as good for the players to sign it overall. And the players didn't want to sign it. And Bichetti didn't understand that what, what, what would have happened if they didn't sign it. And, it, and that was pretty much presented to the players as a take it or leave it the day before the start of the season, which was the day that the document, because the document has to be submitted to the Football League before the season starts. So it was sort of, you have to sign it now or it's going away. And they obviously wanted to take it away, read it, discuss it, discuss it with the PFA or whatever. And there was no time to do that because the season was starting less than 24 hours later. So this caused quite a lot of unrest rightly so, um, um, you know, amongst the, the dressing room. And I, I went into to the, the boardroom where Bichetti was sat and I had some papers in my hand and I pretty much sort of like threw them down onto the desk with a pen and said, sign these. And he looked up at me and said, what are you talking about? I, I won't sign this. I don't know what it is. I said, well, that's what you've just done to the players. You've asked them to sign a document that they haven't had time to read or review and told them that if they don't sign it, it's going away. The, the, the bonuses are going away, which you can't do anyway. Right, it's time to introduce another character, Mauro Milanese, which isn't Milan's take on the spaghetti bolognese. Who is it? Mauro Milanese, well, no stranger to English football now, because he did play for Queen's Park Rangers, of course. Um, so I think when he was appointed sporting director, I actually thought, OK, well, you know, they're bringing in the guy who, who knows the English game. Uh, he's played here, and he had a distinguished playing career. I didn't feel like it was completely left field. And he was going to work with Russell Slade on signings and whatever else it does, uh, sporting director is supposed to do, um, identify talent, etc., cetera, et cetera. Like, I don't know if it unsettled Russell Slade, but I think, you know, if I've been in a job and you've been in a job and someone's come in over you when you've been in charge and doing a good job for a long time. Yeah, yeah I, I just try and undermine them. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Surreptitiously undermine them. <laughs> it was just, when you look back on it now, I think it made things difficult for us. What was going on with his hair? Well, that's one of those things which I can't criticise him for because I wish I had hair like that. <laughs> I wish I had hair like that. I'm sad that this is a podcast in audio format, which means we can't show a picture of what was going on there. Tremendous locks, and I think you should be very proud of them. He should be proud of them. Um, I think perhaps some East London migratory birds had created some sort of home there. Let's have a listen to what Dave Victor thought about Mauro. No, Amori Melanese was a very unusual character in his own right, I think it would be fair to say. I think it was fair to say that he was quite aloof. I mean, obviously, he's from a different country. His English was okay, but it wasn't great. And obviously, his experience of football is a much, much higher level. You know, an, an Italian international um, with a sporting director for late Orient. And, you know, he... He looked out of place. I understand he was staying at the Dorchester. And again, another pre-season story that I understand happened was that he was picked up by a car um, to Northampton and the car waited whilst we played this uh, pre-season friendly um, for the game to finish and then he was taken back to the Dorchester. Now, when you think how tight the budget was, and, you know, I've been there when buckets were taken around on the terraces as a supporter and uh, I remember 
before Barry Hearn took over, how there wasn't enough money to pay the coaches. The thought of somebody on the club's money living in the Dorchester and having a car, which and the car was waiting with the driver outside, you just think, wow, what is happening here in terms of money? And there was so, so much money that was just wasted, absolutely wasted. You stayed at the Dorchester, James? I haven't, have you? I'm always there. No. That's a problem. <laughs> Let's have a listen to what Matt Porter's take on Mauro Milanese was. Mauro was lazy and casual and disinterested and, again, just wanted to do really what, what Bacchetti told him to do, even though behind Bacchetti's back he would say the president is causing problems or whatever. So at this point, I should say that our crack legal team advised us to put these allegations to Mauro Milanese. So we did do that and gave him a chance to respond. He chose not to do that. We also invited him on the podcast, which he also chose not to take us up on. But the offer is still there, Mauro. Please come on to a later episode. We'll hang out. We'll get a haircut together. So let's get into the season itself. Very exciting. To the surprise of absolutely no one on the planet, Orient lost their first game under the Bacchetti regime at home 2-1 to Chesterfield. But they did go on to record one victory and three draws in their next four games, which was not the start Bacchetti was hoping for, I'm sure. Um, But by Orient standards, that's pretty standard. What was your take, James? When new players come into a team that's been established and um, you've got to give those players time to, to gel and to, to balance the ethos of the club and to understand their teammates and, and, what, and what Russell wants from them. Behind the scenes again, perhaps not visible to Orient fans, there were signs that something that was going to become a dominant theme over the next three seasons uh, was starting to happen, which was interference in team selection from Bacchetti himself. This is Matt Porter on that. Russ, Russ got in trouble for not picking the new signings for the very first game of the season, even though they weren't match fit. You know, he got an email from Bacchetti telling him he expected to see them in the team and Russ's argument that he was very keen to play them and obviously that's why he'd signed them, but they they weren't fit. It just wasn't wasn't listened to. So, yeah, the, the, you know, I, it wasn't fair on the, on the guys who were picking the team. And then Dave Victor had some good insights on how Russell Slade, the manager, was being treated at the time. Yes, you got the sense that um, Russell was unhappy, that a lot of the the players were unsettled. And obviously there were players coming in very quickly on much bigger uh, contracts. And, you know, it was an open secret of just how much some of these players were earning. But I think it was the lack of respect shown to uh, Russell Slade that was the real concern and the, the real surprise uh, and it would have taken some time for these new players of whom there were some very good players not least uh, Joby McEnough uh, of course and Jay Simpson but they needed time So next up was a home game against Colchester United which Orient contrived to lose 2-0 leaving them with 6 points from 6 games and sitting 18th in the table then, Sporting Director Mauro Milanese entered the home dressing room during the post-match team talk and communicated to Russell Slade that if they failed to win the next game, then he would be sacked. Controversially, Russell came out and in his post-match interview revealed that conversation to all and sundry. Do you remember that? It was outrageous, wasn't it? I mean, here's a guy who has come into the Aitken Warrior, rescued them first and foremost then created a side that has really captured the hearts of, of the fans, um, taken them to the League One player final, playing a brand of football that has been fabulous to watch. And then a few weeks later, here he is, his whole world has changed, new owners, and suddenly he's being treated as if he's a nobody. It was a very petulant thing to do, to say, you've got to win the next game or you're out. I mean, that's not how you run your football club. It's a curious motivational tactic. I haven't read this in any uh, business books. I haven't read any business books, but I, I don't think it's in any business books. 
Um, let's have a listen to what um, Dave Victor's take on that was. It was a lack of respect. And it meant that the supporters, I think up until then, were happy to give the benefit of the doubt to the new owner. I think they were shocked by the way that uh, Russell was treated. It's an indication that this is a very different culture and a culture that doesn't belong at Brisbane Road. So the next game was just three days later, a Tuesday night at Meadow Lane against Notts County. A cold, bitter, actually I can't remember what the weather was like, um, but Russell Slade's future was on the line. The game actually ended in a 1-1 draw, so I'll let Dave Victor pick up the story of what happened next. What happened at Meadow Lane that night was very, very peculiar. We'd assumed that uh, a win and Russell would be in charge um, for the next game. A defeat, he would be shown the door. Nobody really knew what was going to happen with the draw. But in the end, and I think from memory, it was about half past 11, uh, the meeting finally finished and Russell came out uh, and he explained that he'd had a meeting, that they cleared the, the air and that he thought he was still the manager of Lake Noyant. And Captain Nathan Clark was in the team that night at Notts County. Let's have a listen to what he said about this strange turn of events. With the new chairman and the sort of volatile, volatility of, of everything building up around that, you always sort of feared that, that Russell was um, was certainly putting his neck out on the line in that sense that he was getting put under a lot of pressure and, you know, we were desperate to do well for him. Um you know, and I remember getting back on the coach after the game and it was, you know, everything was, was up in the air. We weren't 100% sure what was happening. We seemed to be waiting around a long time and, um, yeah, it wasn't a, wasn't a nice time, unfortunately. Three days later, I remember I was on the train to Swansea. I got a message saying, um, have, you seen, have you seen the news? And I thought, well, no, I've been asleep, obviously. I'm on the train to Swansea. And there was a, I think it was a talk sport journalist who just tweeted that Cardiff City um, were looking to appoint Slade as a, as a new manager. So there was all sorts of speculation going on. Slade was the bookies' favourite to take over at Cardiff, but in the meantime, managed to lead Orient to a victory away at Scunthorpe on the Saturday. By the next Tuesday, nothing was much clearer, and Orient were at home to Sheffield in the League Cup where Bacchetti chose to air his version of events so far in his column in the match programme, which I think is worth us listening to here. It's voiced by an actor. I say an actor, it's actually my Italian cousin Marco, so thank you. Um, but let's have a listen to what Bacchetti had to say. At the end of the game, I sent Mauro Milanese into the locker room to express the disappointment with the leadership on the defeat. The message was, if with the next match there was no redemption, we would be forced to remove Russell's light from his position and any responsibility would be with the team itself. Good message. Terrible message. Terrible message. But I just think, again, it speaks to a lack of, a fundamental lack of understanding how to run a football club or any sort of sports team or any kind of business. After having totaled seven points in seven games, uh, required from all of us a serious and thorough reflection and the taking of responsibility by all, without exception. So before you jump in, I'm pretty sure this has been run through Google Translate. It's not, it's not for me to criticise someone's prose as an editor, that, you know, it's definitely not mine. No, I I'll, definitely don't do that. No. I'll do that. Yeah. Let's continue. Just after Mauro Milanese left the changing room, I see that Russell repeated to the press what was said in the changing room. I have to say it left me very puzzled, because I have always believed that anything said in the changing room is covered by secrecy and shared in an iron pact of inviolability between players, the coach and the club. So just to repeat that, Bacchetti believes that anything said in the changing room is covered by secrecy enshrined in an iron pact of inviability. Are you aware of the pact? The secret pact of iron inviability? Not that particular pact. No? I think I know You've what you're saying. You've worked in football a long time. I have. I've never heard that phrase, I've got to be honest with you. Um, that, that's a new one on me. Then, despite my many commitments, thus the night I went, because in a such delicate moment, I felt I had to be present. Sorry, is he, is he justifying going to work? <laughs> I think it's easy to criticise, James, but have you ever established a multi-billion dollar waste management business in Albania? 
Not yet. No, in families, husbands and wives quickly often, and sometimes say they will leave, but then usually remain together, or parents threaten to spank their children, but usually do not carry out the treat. So once again, parents threaten to spank their children, but usually do not carry out the threat. I would not get him to babysit, is my first take on that. He wouldn't be my first choice of childminder. No. In that moment, I felt I had to give a wake-up jolt. But for me, it's wrong to dismiss a coach during the season. And even then, I would only do it in extreme cases. I feel like that oh, quote might come back to you. <laughs> Keep listening to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the team did not win the game on Tuesday. But I did not relieve Russell of his post, regardless of the pressure from the press and you. Regardless of the pressure from the press, it was your fault. Yeah, the, Actually, your fault. It was my fault. I was all the one who walked was, into the changing room. All the pressure well. was coming from yeah, you. Yeah, it was just, just me and Dave Victor sitting there. Yeah. yeah. Because there are times that the president must have the strength to take unpopular decisions, even against everyone. And in the moment of need, I feel that strength inside. I don't know who edited this copy, but I would just cut that last. That doesn't mean anything. That last cut. No, just cut it. Someone might think that rush to tell the press what happened in the locker room could be linked uh, to the interest of Cardiff. While instead, I believe, blinding Russell, until proven otherwise. Look, at the end of the day, Russell Slade was put in an impossible position. He was told that he was going to lose his job unless Orient won a game. If I'm told by my boss that I'm going to be out after one more misstep, I'm looking around. But what is vital, and that all should be convinced of, is that what we do is for the good of Leighton Orient. And I don't know, I'd love to know who read that at the time and thought, this is normal. I wonder if anyone took it at face value and thought, okay, yeah, I get it. But I, I don't think they did. So, Orient lose their next game, a League Cup tie against Sheffield United by a goal to nil. And a few days later, Russell Slade resigns stating a breakdown in relationship with the new owners. First of all, I think it's really sad that Russell's time already ended like that because I don't think it, he deserved to go like that. I think by the time he's decided to resign, things have gone so, so south that there was nowhere else for him to turn. He'd been undermined constantly. Interference in team selection. Players coming that he... You know, the, we've heard that he wasn't that keen on or wasn't that interested in. So if you're a manager and you can't pick the team, you can't choose the transfers, and you're being told that if you don't win, you're going to lose your job, I can't imagine that's a very attractive place for you to work. So yeah, Russell has gone the first of 11 different managers that served under Bacchetti during his three years at the club. He left us in 17th place in League One after eight games. And that is where we're going to end episode one. Was it fun, James? I think I'll do it again, yeah. It was quite a long pause after I said, was it fun? Dramatic effect. So just to recap, Orion are currently 17th in the table after eight games russell slade has moved on in episode two what are we going to talk about well matt if you thought things were bad they're going to get a lot worse we're going to meet three new managers in the space of a few weeks we'll meet some high profile signings that didn't exactly work out and we'll find out why the new ceo wanted to close the club shop the CEO is one of my favourite characters in this drama, so I'm excited about introducing him in the next episode. Uh, and I should say one of those high profile signings is an Italian international. So uh, I hope everyone tunes in and listens to episode two. Thank you for listening to this one. But for the moment, we will bid everyone goodbye. And I'll say Arrivederci. Does that mean goodbye in Italian? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect.